The following program was a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. called Fish, who lived on the outskirts of the Kansaska and Abranzas border and caused a hurricane? Sounds like a tall tale to me. Hello, my name is Emily Godfrey, your host of this edition of Meet the Author. Today, with your help, we talk all things Savvy, Scumble, and Switch with my special guest, Ingrid Law. Ingrid, welcome to our program about the writing process. Thank you, Emily. It's great to be here. Well, I use the term tall tale, stories with outrageous and extrav ex extravagant events. What would you use to describe a tall tale? Well, tall tales were very important to me when I was writing these books because I was looking for an American kind of magic that never used magic. So I thought superheroes at first because that's American, but I thought tall tales are even better. Well, how do characters like Mibs, Rocket, and Fish fit into the tradition of American tall tales? Well. While their powers may seem to be supernatural or extraordinary like a superpower or magic, in a way you can also think of them as metaphors, which we'll talk about a little bit more soon, I'm sure, but uh, they help explain what the children are feeling and experiencing. And tall tales help explain how things occurred in a very exaggerated and silly way sometimes. Well, for those of us who ha maybe haven't read the book Savvy, can you explain what it's about and describe what a Savvy is? Certainly. So, in my stories, the children all belong to a family in which whenever somebody has a 13th birthday, they come into an extraordinary talent they call their Savvy. And this could range from anything from reading minds to becoming invisible to levitating, even to being able to reach out and grab radio waves out of the air and store them in jars. Well, we've received a question from Mrs. Kolb's class in Baker, Louisiana, and it sounds a lot like a question we received from a student in Springfield, Virginia. Let's listen. If you had a savvy, what would it be and how would you use it? All right, so, so what would your savvy be? Well, these days, I would want a savvy that would allow me to teleport anywhere because then I would be able to visit my family in far off places and any place I would like to travel and visit without having to go to the airport to catch a plane. <laughs> that sounds like a very good savvy, very convenient. Well, let's go to an email question from Mrs. St. Pierre's fourth grade class. When did you discover you wanted to become a writer? I had been making up stories in my head ever since I was a kid, but when I was a young person, I never wrote my stories down because my handwriting was so slow and my imagination was so fast. And I think that's a very common problem for yeah. a lot of people. So it wasn't until I was in high school and learned to type because I didn't have to learn to type until high school. I'm that old. <laughs> but um, that, that was when I first started writing. Well, as students in Mrs. Gochin's class discovered, everyone has a savvy or would like one. Real or imagined, students thought about their own savvies. Let's take a look. If I could have a made up savvy, it would be super speed. If I could have any savvy, it would be telekinesis. My savvy in real life is figure skating and dance. I consider it as a gift. If I had one more savvy or a made up savvy, it would be to control things. If I had a savvy, it would be the power to take away savvies. If I had a savvy, it would be the power to figure out problems quickly. If I could have any savvy, it would be the power to read minds. My savvy in real life is learning things fast.
Telekinesis, the power to move things with your mind, that sounds like the twins in Scumble. It does, indeed. Well, how did you choose to have the twins, like, one can move things up and down, the other one can move things side to side? How did you come up with that? Well, because they were twins, I wanted them to be able to share a power, and I thought of them like the two knobs of an Etch-a-Sketch. So if you recall what an Etch-a-Sketch does, it has two knobs and it makes lines. One makes lines that go up and down, mm -hmm. one makes lines go side to side. But if you want to make a curve, you got to move both lines together. So that was how I thought of their talents in particular. They had to learn to work together, and they would as twins. And they caused a lot of pranks with that they as well. They do certainly do that. <laughs> well, here's another email question. This question is from St. James School in Falls Church, Virginia. How do you begin the planning process for writing a book? Do you type your ideas? Do you create webs, outlines? Do you handwrite everything? The first thing I do, Emily, is I gear up. So I have these gloves. And you know, soccer players, they have shin guards. And football players, they have football helmets and shoulder pads. I've got my protective magical gloves. And I call them magical. They're not really magical. <laughs> However, as soon as I put them on, because I've been wearing them for so many years, I put them on and it's like my brain knows it's time to write. Because I don't wear them when I'm just doing other things on the computer, only when I'm ready to write. So I got my gloves on and then usually, here's how I work. When I'm starting a new book, mm -hmm. I come up with a character I love, a character that means a lot to me. Then I figure out what that character wants more than anything else in the world. And that's usually the end of the story, whether he or she gets what he wants. So for instance, in Savvy, Mibs wants to get down to the hospital where her father is after a terrible car mm -hmm. accident. So I have my character, I know what she wants, and then everything in between is where I torture her. <laughs> no, that's where the obstacles occur and everything that helps the character learn and grow and where the, a lot of the action occurs. So I start with that basic idea and that's what helps me figure out where I'm going throughout the process. I'm gonna wear my gloves now through the rest of this. I like that. <laughs> do you outline this? Like, Do you come up with those events in the middle beforehand or do you like let them kind of come as she as she tackles one obstacle, she gets the next one thrown at her. Uh, well, basically, this sounds a little weird, and other authors will tell you this too. When the writing is going well, my characters tell me what needs to happen next, mm -hmm. if it's going well. If it's not, I have to sit and I have to plot and I have to organize. Uh, so I do spend a lot of time trying to figure out what sorts of obstacles are going to occur that will lend themselves to the themes of the book, to the growth of my characters. Um, but primarily, I love to just dive into the story and see where all the writing takes me. That can lead me down some avenues that are dead ends at times, but uh, that's where my inspiration really comes from. Some writers are more plotters, and some are what we call plungers, where you just dive in. <laughs> I think the best writers, though, are ones who can do both. Some mm -hmm. plotting, and some just diving in and free writing and see what happens. Can you explain what a story arc is and how that kind of fits in? Okay, so, well, here's how I think of a story arc. You have to start out with an inciting incident, so something that goes wrong. And then you have to start building the level of drama to be sort of, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, and then have the, you know, the resolution to it. So <laughs> every time it has to get worse and worse and worse. <laughs> you know, you don't want your big conflicts and then littler and littler and littler mm -hmm. conflicts. It rises, that's why they call it an arc. Oh. rises like that and then descends. Well, how does Switch differ from your other books? Well, Switch is different for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's the only story that takes place in a big city. Mm -hmm. 
And generally I stick to small towns in my books. I like the idea of setting my stories in rural areas or little out of the way places maybe that, you know, because kids live in these little small towns and they need to have these great stories too about their communities. But Switch also has a brand new main character. Every one of my books does. Mm -hmm. And I do that because they're coming of age stories. So it's about the process of having this savvy birthday, this birthday in which you come into this extraordinary power. And I wanted to explore that from different points of view. So Gypsy Beaumont tells the story in Switch, and she's the little sister of Mibs Beaumont, who tells the story in Savvy. And they're both the cousins of the character in Scumble. And did you know that you were going to write three novels when you wrote Savvy, or did you just start out writing Savvy? I just started out writing Savvy. I was just joyfully writing. I left the ending a little ambiguous, like who knows what would happen when the next birthday came around. And I knew I had a big family and I had a lot of opportunities to write more stories. Well, our students are writers too. They write, edit, revise, and publish. From one writer to another, let's see what young writers think about when they read the books by Ingrid Law. Why do all three books, Savvy, Scumble, and Switch, all start with the letter S? Why did you switch the characters in the second book, Scumble? Why did you give Rocket electrical powers? Who is your favorite character and why? All good questions. Let's start with the last one. Who is your favorite character and why? I think my favorite character has to be Samson. And Samson is a secondary character, but he's in all three books. Uh, there are several characters who are in all three books, but Samson has this dear to my heart quality. And he's seven in the first book and 16 in the second two books. Um, maybe he's a little bit like my own child or a little bit like me. He's somebody who likes to spend a lot of time by himself and he's very quiet. But when he does show up, He's able to bring strength and a different level of energy to other people. And would you mind telling everyone what Samson savvy is? Samson has the most complicated savvy of anybody. Samson, when he turned 13, he turned invisible. But when he's invisible, he stores up strength that when he reappears, he can pass to that strength to other people with a touch. So he's what I consider my savvy powered introvert. And if you don't know what an introvert is, an introvert is somebody who recharges their batteries at the end of a long day if they're really tired, they just spend the time by themselves. An extrovert is somebody who wants to be around a lot of people and that's how they feel recharged. And one isn't any better than the other, but Samson is definitely an introvert. I mean, introverts would love to be invisible. And when introverts do show up, though, we can really bring a lot to the world. And so that's reflected in his ability to bring strength to other people. That's awesome. Thanks. And why do all your books start with the letter S? Why do all my books start with the letter S? Well, at first, I just knew I wanted a title, Savvy, Savvy, because I thought it was the most unique element of the book. Um, we haven't touched on it yet, but the reason I use the word savvy, I use that word instead of magic, instead of superpowers, because the word savvy means to be good at something. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us are good at something, so I want readers to be able to come to the end of the story and say, what's my savvy? So I'd written savvy, and then I was writing scumble, and, and that's another weird word. Mm -hmm. And it's the word I use for the children to say they're learning to control their powers. They're learning to mm -hmm. scumble their savvy. And in that book, the main character, Ledger, he is stuck in Wyoming until he can learn to scumble his savvy because he makes everything fall apart. So Ledge can't get on a plane or a mm -hmm. bus or a car. You really <laughs> don't want him on a plane. And so he has to learn to scumble his savvy. And then I had a pattern started. 
And once I've started a pattern, by the time I got to the third book switch, I couldn't call it the 13th birthday of Gypsy Beaumont. It wouldn't have matched. So it worked out well, though, because in Switch, the characters' savvies all switch to something else. Mm -hmm. So if I made a fourth book, I would have to come up with another S word. <laughs> Well, I understand we have one more question. Let's take a peek. How do you come up with all these funny words in your book? Before we answer that, let's provide our viewers with a few samples of savvy vocabulary. How about I'll say a word, or I'll say a definition, and you try to tell me the, the savvy word that goes with it. Okay. Are you ready for the first one? I am ready. Okay, the definition is elaborate decoration or the sound of a rustling skirt? That would be frou-frou. Fantastic. Frou-frou is the word. <laughs> All right, here's the next definition. Diagonal or askew? Mm, catawampus. Catawampus it is. And the third one is, the definition is frivolous and showiness. Mm, I know that one too. It's frippery. Frippery. And that is a really fun word to say. It is. I, in fact, the reason I make some of these word choices is to provide entertaining vocabulary that's real vocabulary. I'm a word collector, so I collect words that are fun to say but may not sound like real words. I love words with double letters, words that make your tongue and your mouth do interesting things, <laughs> uh, like Jim Jams and Dunkel and Foozle and Flapdoodle and Snollygoster. Oh, that is a good one. I love asking kids what they think a Snollygoster is, and I can tell you that a lot of people think it has something to do with a goose or something to do with, can I say it, boogers. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually a person who lies or cheats. Really? And I got to put my very favorite word in switch. My What's, favorite word of yeah. all time. What is this word? Sardoodledum. And what does this word mean? <laughs> Sardoodledum is when people are being over dramatic. <sighs> <laughs> or when there's a lot of contrived plot structure or, you know, it's just, it's um, like a soap opera would be sardoodledum. Oh, I think I've suffered from that in the past. I think we all suffer from sardoodledum <laughs> every now and then. Where do you look for your words? Do you just, in the dictionary or anywhere else? Well, sitting by my favorite chair at home, I do have a dictionary and a thesaurus. However, I also love word of the day websites. Oh. Uh, one of my favorite ones was the worthless word of the day, which I don't think any words are worthless. No. Um, so I find them in all sorts of places. I find them in other books I'm reading. And uh, there was a book I was reading recently and I just got a new word out of it. And what was it? What was it? It's gonna escape me now. You can tell me later okay. if it comes to you. Okay, all right, thank you. Do you ever make up any of your words in the books? Like scumble, is that a made up word? Scumble seems like a made up word, but it is not a made up word. Scumble is actually a painting term. Now what I do do with my words sometimes in my books is I'll take a real word like savvy or scumble and then I'll give it a twist, my own little twist, but I'm an author, I can do that. <laughs> so my next question for you is very important to me. Is it true that Savvy is going to be made into a movie? And if it is true, can you give us any details? I wish I could tell you that that was going to be the case. I did have a movie contract for about seven years, and there was a director and a screenplay, and it was all very exciting. But then, you know, the movie world is a little unpredictable. And so for now, it's been put on hold. <sighs> I know. That is a bummer. It is a bummer. <laughs> I'm a big movie goer, so I would have loved to see it as a movie. Yeah. Do, who would you have wanted to play as Mips? Did you ever think oh, about that? Oh, well, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm sure kids would have some good ideas for oh, that. Oh, I bet they would. So if you are just tuning in, you are watching Meet the Author with special guest Ingrid Law. Now let's return to the classroom and learn what students want to know from the author of Savvy, Scumble, and Switch. Roll the tape. Wait. They don't roll tape, just press the button. 
How do you come up with all of the metaphors and similes? How did you get the ideas for the names and personalities for each character? Did you get any of the ideas for the book from your real life? Fantastic questions. Let's start with the first one. Where do you come up with your metaphors and similes? And maybe actually, could you describe what a metaphor and simile are for our viewers? Certainly. So a metaphor and a simile each compare two things that are unlike so that a, a reader has a deeper meaning of something. For instance, take life and a roller coaster. So this, many people may have heard this particular metaphor and simile. A metaphor would say, life is a roller coaster full of ups and downs. Now to ch change that into a simile, you would just add the word like or as. So then it would become, life is like a roller coaster. Okay. That's the basic difference between a metaphor and a simile. And how do you come up with the ones you've used in the books? Well, I think metaphors and similes are wonderful tools to help readers picture certain things and really feel them. So for instance, in Savvy, there is a simile in the first chapter. The rain fell like stones thrown by a playground bully. Okay, so I needed to give an example of how hard and mean that mm -hmm. rain was falling and how scary it felt. And I thought, well, if rocks were being thrown at me by a playground bully, I would have a reaction to that feeling. It wouldn't just be the rain fell hard. Oh no, there's so much more going on with that rain. So uh, authors use these sort of devices to help our readers really feel things. That's really helpful information for our writers out there. Definitely. So my next question is, how did you get the ideas for the names and personalities of the characters in your books? Well, my characters do have some unusual names. I have Rocket and Fish and Mibs, and in the second book there's Ledger and a girl named Mesquite. And so I love naming characters. Um, Sometimes I tell kids it's like naming pets. You, sometimes you get a new pet and you look at that pet and you know immediately what that pet needs to be called. And other times you need to observe your new pet for a little while or your new character in your story. However, in my books, I wanted the main magical savvy families to have unusual names and then with Mibs, the main character of Savvy, I wanted to give her a name or a nickname that stood out even from her siblings. So I, tra I racked my m mind for a nickname I'd never heard before, mm -hmm. like something I'd never heard anybody called before. And I came up with Mibs. And since then, I've had two people email me who say, my name is Mibs. How really? did you find that name? So it's... It's interesting that we can try to think of the thing we've never, ever heard before, and there's still going to be somebody out there with that same, that same yeah. experience. Yeah, do you ever pull any um, other inspiration from real life for your, for your books? Well, I think authors are always observers. Mm -hmm. Writers watch people. We are very in tune with what's going on around us and how things work in the world. I've never taken a specific person in my life and said, oh, I'm going to turn that person into a character in my book, um, mostly because I want all my friends and family to still love me at the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we just draw on our own experiences and the things we observe in the world around us. And how did you choose to give Rocket electrical powers? How did I choose to get rocket electrical powers? I'll admit something to you. Okay. In the very first draft, Rocket did not have electrical powers. Really? He did not. However, when my editor suggested that maybe the savvy that he did have was too close to his brother's because fish can create hurricanes, 
uh, and I had made Rocket make it rain. I thought oh. those are like connected, which maybe brothers would have connected powers, but I wanted something a little more unique. Mm -hmm. Then I remembered how all the time I was growing up, anytime there was a TV show or a book or something that had an electric character, I loved that character. Plus his name was Rocket. so. You know, he needed something with some spark to it. Some power behind yeah, exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Well, can you tell me a little bit more about your editing process? How you revise your books? What, what do you do? Well, um, of course, I do have an editor who, when, when I turn in my manuscripts to my editor, she'll come back and give me like a six-page letter of ideas that oh, can wow. help make the book better. or. Mostly it's questions, and I compare this a lot to actually when kids get their papers back from their teachers and they're all marked up, mm -hmm. it's very similar to that same thing. A teacher is trying to get kids, their students, to do their best work, and an editor is trying to get me to do my best work. And so it's a matter of looking at the story, seeing what it's missing, seeing where I can fill in, how to make it you know, a richer, better story, something that's more fun or easier to understand in places. Uh, but I do spend a lot of time editing and revising my work. And sometimes it's a matter of unlocking. Like I feel like my brain is locked into place with certain ideas, and then I gotta unlock those ideas so that new ideas can come in. Hmm. What did you do before you were a published author? Oh, before I was a published author, I did a variety of things, but I did work for a long time for the government. Really? And I issued marriage licenses, and I, I helped the public with getting copies. And not, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. the most exciting job, but it gave me a lot of opportunity to spend time in my head where, and it gave me the opportunity to meet some interesting people, like the marriage couple I was writing a marriage license for, and I asked her where she was born, and she told me she was from outer space. Oh. So that gave me a story idea right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you want young people to remember when they read books like Savvy, Scumble, and Switch? Well, I think what I really hope readers will come away from the books with is the idea that we've all got something that is something that we are talented at or working hard to get better at. Because the kids in my books, when they get these powers, when they get their savvy talents, they can't control them. They're just, everything is going haywire. And so sometimes when we're learning new things, it feels the same way. Or when new life experiences are happening to us, it feels the same way. Like everything's out of control. How am I ever going to be able to get a handle on math? How am I ever going to get a handle on reading? It's so hard. But the kids in my books, even though maybe with the things they're trying to get a handle on are the ability to not make a huge windstorm whenever they're angry, you know, we're all working toward saying, what's my savvy? How can I improve? Well, Ingrid Law, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. It's been wonderful to have you and to talk about Savvy, Scumble, and Switch. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Emily. Well, if you would like to learn more about Ingrid Law, visit your local library or visit her website at www.ingridlaw.com. To learn more about this program, visit the Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Emily Godfrey. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. Thanks for watching.